if a ground anchor fails to meet proof load re uh, requirements, then the, the first thing is the inspector has to uh, look over all the detailed data that they've had, uh, the grout takes, uh, whether an unusual amount of soil was removed from uh, out of the drill hole, uh, whether there was water present, whether there was anything unusual in terms of the actual bond zone length that went in the ground, all the various details that can affect anchor performance and needs to bring those together and see uh, if they can understand why the failure occurred and should contact the engineer record and really talk that out uh, as to uh, whether uh, it was understandable why failure occurred. The fact of the matter is sometimes we don't understand why failures occur. They do, uh, we, uh, as I said, some, uh, it's not uncommon to have two to three percent failures on a good job, so oftentimes you don't know why an anchor uh, failed. But you need to get to that point that you really understand that you don't know and that you've gone through all the probable causes and you can't determine it, in which case then uh, you might uh, simply replace the anchor and, and uh, not go further. But oftentimes uh, the inspector will be faced with a situation where it carried some load and so you need to determine what is that load that it actually ca uh, carried before it started pulling out of the ground continuously. Because that load then as a failure load can be divided by two and that oftentimes can be an acceptable load for that anchor to carry. So it's a useful anchor and the structural engineers then can evaluate is that anchor at 50 percent of the load uh, compatible with the entire system and sometimes a, a replacement anchor doesn't have to be drilled. So the inspector needs to verify what was the maximum load that, uh, that that anchor carried and quickly refresh themselves as to all the, all the issues that went on during construction, whether there was anything unusual so that you might be able to pinpoint the cause. Yes, uh, the, the minimum uh, uh, instrumentation that, that we recommend be used during common production soil nail, uh, both proof testing and verification testing, are a minimum of uh, two, two dial gauges uh, at, the, at the head of the nail to, to, uh, to, to monitor for, uh, uh, to make sure that we're not getting any excessive uh, rotation and that the jack is aligned uh, uh, properly with the with the head of, of the nail uh, and of course a jack pressure gauge uh, a load cell for use again during the uh, creep testing portion of the test. Uh, a load cell is uh, strongly recommended and should be used uh, in soil nail test or ground anchor testing uh, t particularly for monitoring the uh, load during the creep test portion of the nail or anchor. Uh, during the design life of a structure, which is commonly 75 to 100 years, uh, the nail or anchor is constantly under load and that can cause some deformation in the ground. So during the testing, we want to get an estimate of what that long-term deformation will be to make sure that it's within the acceptable movement limits of a structure. For example, it might be one inch over the 75 to 100 years. During the the test that's used to evaluate that is, is what we call the creep testing portion of the, the load test. And during that, the load is held constant for, it can vary from typically from 10 minutes to 60 minutes. The amount of movement that can occur is often quite small. And it's sensitive to variations in the small variations in the load. A jack pressure gauge typically is such that it may take several hundred pounds, maybe a thousand pounds of load change to actually see the dial move. And that's not accurate enough for creep testing. The load cells will tell us uh, it, it, within a few pounds if the load has changed. So it's important for both the more accurate, more sensitive readings and to know if the load has changed during that load hole so that the jack 
gauge can be hit to get the load back up to where the, uh, what the load test requirement is. Storage and handling uh, of uh, anchors is uh, a very simple kind of thing, and yet uh, paying attention to detail is, is in, awfully important for the inspector. Uh, generally speaking, uh, the anchors need to be protected uh, from the raw elements. Uh, we need to keep rain off of them. We need to keep soil off of them. In a construction zone, there's a lot of them. Sometimes in rainy season, there's a lot of dirt flying around, or, and so we need to keep them relatively clean. Uh, we might get uh, minor uh, rusting, uh, and that's okay. That can be wire brushed off, but heavy rusting or pitting is unacceptable. So we need to protect them, and basically that's done by placing the anchor on planks or timbers to keep them immediately off of the ground. Yes, I've installed anchors below the water table. Uh, it, Part of it has to do with understanding where the source of water is. If it's landslides uh, and there's fissures or graben fractures in the landslide and it may be localized water, uh, oftentimes you can drill the hole and the water will come gushing out and you simply let that water get out of there and then uh, once it's stabilized, uh, then you can go in and place the anchor without too much difficulty. Other times, uh, if it's below the water, then it's best to, to uh, control the environment well, like using drilled casing and pressure grouting, where uh, the casing can be placed. You can put the, uh, the steel tendon inside the casing and cap it off and pump grout and force the water uh, out of the hole into the soil and the grout uh, moving into the soil and making a tight bond on the perimeter of the anchor bond zone. Uh, if you have artesian uh, conditions, then it's even more important to use casing methods and pressure to try to accomplish a tight bond in the grout um, soil bond zone and, uh, and keeping uh, the artesian water from flowing along the perimeter and eroding away the, uh, the soil and, and uh, reducing long-term capacity. Artesian uh, water is a very troublesome uh, issue. Uh, the others can generally be handled with casing and, um, and uh, pressure grouting. Uh, but if a person is using hollow stem anchors, hollow stem auger to uh, drill in anchors and they encounter uh, uh, water, then all too often you wind up with flowing ground and, and you have failure. So that can be uh, quite the wrong uh, tool to be using with water. Okay, our, our specifications are, are really designed to be performance specifications, although there are some things in them that are more prescriptive than performance-based. And by performance-based, as far as the anchor is concerned, we really try to leave the uh, diameter of the anchor and the method of constructing that anchor and getting the capacity out of that anchor up to the contractor. Uh, so the contractor can determine the final diameter of the hole, whether or not uh, it needs to be cased. Um, most importantly, the grouting method in the hole, which has a tremendous effect on the capacity of the anchor, whether you simply use uh, gravity grout or whether you um, pressure grout system or secondary or other grouting systems, high pressure grout systems. Uh, has a large effect on the capacity of the anchor. And these are soil and material dependent, so it's up to the contractor to um, 
review the soils, rock conditions at the site, and determine what the best methods and means are uh, for constructing that anchor. And that needs to be done early on in the uh, project, during the verification testing. Uh, verification tests, we may do several verif verification tests. Uh, different hole diameters, different grouting procedures, different equipment to come up with the, um, the procedure that the contractor wants to use in the project. And so try and use that or, or let the contractor decide what that method is to do uh, to construct the anchor and get the load and get the capacity that is required for on the plans. And then we simply go out and test it and make sure that it, it meets the design specifications. We three, agreed three. it to three times, three times the neat volume of the hole. Uh, if you look at it in terms of the volume of a six inch hole, you know, typically 40 feet deep or so, it's not all that much. But there are places where there's no end to pumping neat cement grout, or even a fairly thick cement grout. So on this particular project, we came up with uh, three times the neat volume. And that was agreed to by the contractor. And so once that was agreed to, we have to keep track of how much grout was put down each one of these holes to see if there was indeed an excess of three times the neat volume. And where it was, we paid for that amount. When you have excessive grout takes, one of the main things you can do is decrease the slump. Add a, a go with a sand cement mixture and, and develop a, a grout that has a very, very low slump to it, a very thick slump, almost to the point of where it's very difficult to pump. And there's a wide range of, of slumps uh, that can be developed. Um, and it's up to the contractor to, in our view, to come up uh, with the most um, viscous, low slump grout um, that's feasible to be pumped in these problem areas uh, and use that in these areas. And beyond that, if there's still um, excessive grout take, and excessive, I mean more than the whole, than the neat volume of the hole. That's not excessive in terms of claims. And what it turns into is what is a reasonable uh, excessive amount that the contractor should have expected uh, in this type of material and largely it's material dependent. You have to look at the boring logs and see why is this excessive grout taking place? Are there voids of these gravels here? Or is this something that should be expected or is it a complete unknown uh, condition, a change of conditions? Taking that into account, you can come up and we have with a, what we felt was a reasonable amount of um, or percentage increase over the neat volume of the hole, proposed that with the, uh, negotiated that with the contractor and came to an agreement of what would be um, reasonable to have expected during the time of bid as far as um, using reasonable means of, you know, a thick grout in these holes, what you c still should have expected to have um, put down these holes in these given areas. Once you get going into production, most of the time uh, the contractors will um, do a fairly good job of setting up the jacking frame, uh, the uh, instrumentation, have that all set up for you. Uh, just simply come in and zero out the uh, pressure gauge, or rather the uh, strain gauge, and start the test. Um, usually it's set up during the production that you will be um, loading against a very rigid element, either the soldier beam or shotcrete or something, and you won't have large deflection problems during the course of the test. Um, still, you want to maintain proper alignment at all times, uh, get the jack lined up right in the first place, and um, not uh, disturb the uh, tripod that the uh, gauge is set up on. Uh, it takes very small uh, bump or movement to set that off and we're talking about uh, very small increments of movement uh, tenths or hundreds of an inch of movement on these gauges and so even traffic vibrations, equipment vibrations uh, that sort of thing can change 
these readings and it could be very important in determining whether or not the test fails or not. Verification testing equipment consists of um, the jack and the pressure gauges and those come as a set for approval uh, during the uh, review process. And so during the construction of the anchors, they have to be the same as what was prior approved because the loads are calculated from uh, the pressures uh, from the anchors. And it's very important for an inspector to, to verify that the, the jack and the pressure gauges are the same as what was approved. And to be prepared ahead of time as to what these pressures are that correspond to the anchor loads that are required for the test. Um, the uh, anchor testing during uh, the proof test uh, is conducted in a series of loads and each one of those loads corresponds to a pressure on the, uh, on the um, pressure jack. So uh, it's a fairly simple equation to calculate what the pressure needs to be um, at each of those stages and have that ahead of time on the form when you go out to the project. This is needs to be done because oftentimes the constructor, the contractor does not do this. Um, he's, expecting, he's expecting the the inspector to do this. Um, a couple right off are, the first one is not to stand directly behind the jack. That's uh, always the first uh, uh, foremost safety requirement. <laughs> Very dangerous place to stay. You can consider it like a rubber band getting ready to, if that steel tendon breaks, it's going to shoot that whole apparatus right out of the wall. So that is some place you do not want to stand. Um, other than that, um, the safety hazards around there would be if the loads get very high where you may be starting to damage the wall itself, push it into the hillside, you may create some instability in the wall or up behind the wall that you want to be aware of and stop the test at that point and uh, see what's going on. Well, one of the main problems we see right off is during the verification test when uh, the contractor will come out and set up a reaction frame in an area of that's just simply been excavated and um, it's maybe a system of shoring and boards up against uh, a soil excavation cut. And so that would be the reaction frame against a soil cut. Not very rigid system. Install the anchor, install the jack and the whole system and you start doing the test. And then the verification test is usually conducted to twice the design load, so it's a very high load. And we'll start seeing excessive deflection. The reaction frame will start deforming um, radically sometime to the point where the test may become uh, null and void because you just cannot maintain proper alignment uh, of the anchor on the or the jack on the anchor. So one of the most important things is to get a really rigid reaction frame, a real beefy reaction frame during the verification test so this doesn't happen. So you can conduct a verification test all the way through without any misalignment, significant misalignment. Um, within the throw of the jack from start to finish. Uh, probably the most important would be uh, during the uh, upper row of an anchor um, system where you may be, during the course of the test, you may actually be pushing the wall uh, out uh, against the hillside and failing the wall in terms of passive resistance up the hillside. You're pushing the wall into the hill and failing it. And you really want to be careful of that because that's happened. There, there have been cases where it just has not been checked out that there's enough passive resistance behind the wall to take um, the load, especially in a verification test, where again you may be up to twice the load, uh, the design load. And so those are probably the main things that you want to watch out for. Also with uh, utility locates, if there's utilities back there, anywhere near, uh, you probably hit them. <laughs> so don't count on the contractor locating all the utilities. Uh, make sure uh, where they are ahead of time uh, so you can miss them. 
On a uh, anchor, anchor project, whether it be soil nailing or tiebacks, it's extremely critical that the uh, inspector uh, prepares for the project and becomes knowledgeable of the specifications, uh, the plans, the layout for the project, how the anchors are built, um, and what type of contracting method is being employed for the project, which uh, of course typically will be a performance specification uh, for contracting the job. Uh, because if he shows up without this knowledge and without uh, this preparation, uh, he's eventually going to have an impact, uh, probably very early on in the project, on the contractor's uh, performance and eventually potentially uh, the contractor's productivity. Um, it's a given on these projects that the contractor and the inspector are going to be working hand in hand. I mean, it's the inspector's role to, in essence, uh, document, observe, and confirm that the contractor's uh, installations, uh, whether it be tiebacks or soil nails, are in conformance with the plans and specifications. Uh, if you have an inspector who has not prepared uh, for the project and is really not fully versed in the uh, plans, the specifications, it's really going to be difficult for that inspector to uh, provide this confirmation of the contractor's installation. Um, there's no time on a project like this to try to catch up. Uh, and, and become versed in the plans and specs uh, while the work's going. And so the only way to, uh, to make this work happen and to support a contractor in his role on the project and to assure the owner, owner that uh, he's receiving the product that uh, was specified is to show up on the site fully versed in the plans and specs. Uh, this probably becomes uh, even more critical if in fact you're an in inexperienced inspector and this may well be your first, our second, or third project. You also do not have the experience with the, uh, the equipment and the methods that the contractor is going to use. So the only way to assure success on a project, if you are inexperienced, is to at least show up with a full understanding of the plans and specs. I, I tend to think that uh, grout sampling in the field is important because it's a psychological um, issue with my workers with the uh, contractors workers um, they're more likely to pay attention to their mixing and production work if they know that the samples are going to be taken and, and that the product might be rejected field sample grout mixes I like the uh, the flow cone best and the mud balance test I think that's the two on the flow cone it's definitely an immediate test you mix a batch of grout, and uh, it only takes a couple of minutes to uh, run the uh, flow cone test. And we just recently ran some tests where we were mixing grout that was in 3,000 pound bags, and we were adding the required amount of water. We mixed that grout, and then we immediately shut the machine off, took a sample, and we could tell in minutes uh, if we complied with the flow that was written in the specs, and in this case we did. The mud balance, I think, is more of a pay item. If the contractor is being paid per cubic foot for his grout or per gallon for his grout in place, then that gives you an accurate recording of how much grout is being placed because water is very inexpensive, cement is expensive, of course, and uh, how much water you put in, that tells you and with the uh, specific gravity of cement being 3.15 and water 1, you can run your calculator and figure out how much grout has actually been placed. Well, the, the uh, issues of testing on construction have to do with accomplishing the objectives of the design. So there are times when uh, uh, you want to know the ultimate capacity of, a, of an anchor in a particular type of soil with a particular construction methodology and you would actually test it to failure and then apply appropriate factor of safety to achieve a design load. Another type of test is simply a verification test which is uh, pragmatically easier to accomplish in that uh, going into a contract you can size the steel accordingly and load an anchor to uh, some uh, factor of safety beyond design load, commonly twice the design load. 
and verify that the soil and the construction methodology act can accomplish that. And, uh, and then the common production uh, anchor testing is, that is done during contract are performance tests and proof testing. And performance tests will cycle the loads at uh, usually uh, one-fourth the, the design load increments and load them up uh, to, that, to that particular increment and back it off to the alignment load and continue that process on to uh, one and a half times uh, or some predetermined value of the design load. And basically uh, the performance test allows you to look at the load deflection curve. It allows you to see whether uh, the deflections are occurring elastically and that if it if after release of the load back to alignment load there's it releases back to the initial uh, point of deflection at the alignment load then it's basically all elastic deflection in the steel whereas if it doesn't which is more common then there's some kind of movement going into the ground which might be uh, consolidation or compression of the ground as the anchor zone compresses the ground or it might actually be creep. Proof testing is much more simple in that you simply go up uh, in a quarter, a quarter of design load increments on up to the specified maximum load with no cycling of load and if it passes simple criteria on deflection and meets the uh, maximum design load capacity without failure or continuous movement then it's acceptable. Uh, with a ground anchored or tieback system uh, these are these are referred to as active systems where an excavation is the first holes are drilled a heavy structural member commonly referred to as a soldier pile a steel pile is is installed and grouted into the hole vertically then as the excavation is made for each excavation lift uh, the anchors are installed and then they are connected structurally uh, the head of the anchor is connected structurally to this soldier pile system the anchors are then tested or stressed and locked off uh, to actually lock in the design load for each anchor uh, before any further excavation is made. So in this fashion the, the, uh, the, the excavation is always fully supported uh, with restraint provided by that ground anchor soldier pile system. With and, and the soldier pile system is designed to take the full active earth pressure from the ground that's retained behind. With a soil nail system, uh, there are no vertical soldier pile members. Uh, the excavation is made, the holes are drilled, the soil nail is installed in each hole, grouted up full length, then typically a temporary shotcrete facing is applied to retain the near face soils. And with that system, the, the, uh, the active wedge of soil that was, is trying to fail is, is, is then held in place by the uh, soil grout bond uh, between the ground and the grout and the soil nail uh, near, near, near the excavation face. Uh, the active wedge is then held in place by the portion of the soil nail that extends beyond all of the possible failure surfaces in the ground and uh, that provides pull-out resistance to that large active block actually falling off because it's retained behind any potential failure plane. And other areas the inspector should uh, be aware of is uh, when drilling, uh, particularly using uh, Air, air methods removing the cuttings is to wear eye protection, uh, hearing protection for a lot of equipment. And another important area is, uh, is understanding how the drill works uh, during anchor installations and be aware of pinch zones on the drill and uh, backing hazards on the drill. Uh, those are loud uh, machines and the operators uh, are often positioned off to the side and they don't have visibility to all areas of the drill when they're moving it and uh, inspectors should be aware that they, they could uh, accidentally be uh, run over.
Yeah, self self drilling nails in uh, in uh, rock are uh, becoming increasingly popular because they're cost effective methodology. Uh, typically, uh, self drilling nails are uh, only viable if you're willing to accept simple grout protection, simple corrosion protection via having grout coverage only. Uh, they're also only viable if the, uh, if the hole will reasonably stay open and uh, is tight enough so that you can pump grout through the self-drilling nail and the grout will return around the outside of the nail and fill up the hole so you can get uh, that corrosion protection. Well, soil type is certainly very important in that uh, granular soils will produce uh, three to five times the anchor capacity on a lineal foot basis that cohesive soils are uh, will do. So uh, needs to know uh, that kind of relationship. Uh, also, the effect of, of water. Uh, usually, there's softening going on when there's water present, present or there's uh, issues of uh, bond, uh, bonding on the perimeter of the hole if there's water pressure, if there's artesian pressures, and that may influence uh, uh, the capacity of the anchor. Uh, the presence of the water may uh, cause flowing ground in sandy soils. Uh, so uh, that, that water presence is a critical issue. And, uh, and then uh, pressure is very important, and whether that's used. I think I might have had something else. Construction I method. Oh, and construction methodology is very important in that um, typically if a contractor uses drilled casing with pressure they can get very high capacities compared to an open hole casing in a cohesive soil where the grout is trimming in from the bottom. Uh, there can be a significant difference between those two methodologies and then there are other methodologies that are in between. Hollow stem augers, if, it's, if they're used in flowing ground, can extract a lot of soil from within the earth and uh, those voids will uh, significantly alter the capacity of a potential ground anchor.